Our scripture lesson this week comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. Hear these good words. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me anything in my name, and I will do it. Do not let your hearts be troubled. I, I must say that when I read that scripture passage for this week, that it comforted my soul. I found hope in those words. Do not let your heart be troubled. Why is that? Well, for me and for all of us, there are many troubling things going on, aren't there? Jesus said this to his disciples when he realized much more so than they, that their lives were on a collision course to great change. In my Father's house are many rooms, he said. And when I read that, I thought, yes, in God's house, there is a room just for me, a room just for you. That in our sanctuary with the divine, it's, it's a sacred place and it's a comforting place, especially during uncertain times. Jesus' passion, crucifixion, and burial is just right down the road. And what he's wanting to do for his disciples at this point is this. He's wanting to let them know that he is not going to be abandoning them. Even though the world will be turned completely upside down, and all that they had hoped for for three years while they were Jesus and his ministry, it's all going to seem to come crashing down. They will not be able to know even what to do, even whether or not to go outside because they were afraid for their lives. But Jesus wanted to let them know, even though life was going to change drastically for everybody, he was not abandoning them. I don't know about you, but I think some days I feel abandoned. And, and not in an irresponsible way, not that someone has just left me and without any real explanation. No, it's, it's a strange abandonment, isn't it? It's just because I can't see and be with the people that I know and love.
It's so strange to be preaching to empty seats. So it's kind of an abandonment, but like I said, not one done maliciously. Uh, my father died in August of 1999, and then my mother passed on Wednesday before Mother's Day 2007. And I remember after my mother had died that for the first time in my life, I felt orphaned. And here again, it wasn't due to any irrational decision-making. It's a natural process of life. But for the first time in my life, I was experiencing not having my parents with me or at least be able to contact them. And I remember how strange that felt. Yet, they didn't abandon me and they didn't really orphan me because not long after each of them died, they came and visited me and in my dreams and I had a lovely visitation with them. And there have been other times when I've been in deep meditation that I have a visit from them and they still connect with me in a very deep spiritual way. So what I learned from all of that and what I'm even learning still is that we are never truly abandoned. Even though at times it might feel like it, we're never truly abandoned. God is always with us even at times we may feel like God has left us or God is too busy doing other things and God really has very little time to spend on us. When I was in seminary, my whole world had turned upside down. It was a very different life, learning lots of new things. Everything that I came to seminary with, belief-wise, was being challenged. And I remember during our Old Testament survey, Dr. Durham was teaching us about the Psalms. And one section of the Psalms are Psalms of Lament. And basically, it goes this way. The person who writes the Psalm is lamenting that even though they've been loyal to God, and then they worship, and they do their sacrifices, and they do their prayers. God seemed to be absent when their enemies are using them and hurting them, and people are persecuting them, or life turns badly for them. God, where were you when I needed you? But then there's also another common theme at the very end of each psalm of lament. After they pour their heart out, after they're very honest with God about God's absence, then they recognize, but you are God, and I am a person and I know that in your ultimate plan, in your ultimate will, you will work things out. And what Dr. Durham said after that has never left me. It has been a, a very comforting and grounding, grounding statement my whole life. What he said was, these psalms are about the presence of the absent God. Because maybe we feel abandoned, it doesn't mean that we are. In my Father's house are many rooms, and I go there to prepare a place for you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And even if we feel alone and sequestered in a quiet moment, we can feel all the love if we take the time to slow down and just sit and just open our hearts and our minds, we can feel the love of those we miss so much. And we can experience, we can know, gnosko, experiential knowing, we can know intimately this incredible spirit that is with us even in the most of uncertain times. Then Jesus says to his disciples, for I go to prepare a place for you and I'll come and, and guide you because you know where I'm going. Silly Jesus thought that after all this time of teaching his disciples that somehow they would know where he's going. And fortunately, once again, we have Thomas who's very honest about such things. And Thomas says, you know, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And then you have Philip in the conversation who says, we, we don't really need to know the directions. Just show us who God is and we'll be okay with that. Jesus answered them, 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, what does that mean? Most Christian religions throughout history interpret it as only through Christianity and that specific expression of Christianity can one be reconciled to God. You know the old joke about a Baptist goes into heaven and wonders what the big wall is over there and the, gods, and the angel says, oh, don't worry about that. That's the Lutherans. They're the ones who think they're the only ones here, right? So that's the way that text has been interpreted throughout the centuries, that the only way we can be reconciled and be with God is to follow that particular Christian expression of religion. Well, I completely disagree with that premise. Jesus was not then, nor do I believe he is now, asking us to join and participate in a specific religion. Now, some of you may be saying to yourself, how in the world can you say that, Pastor Barton? Well, I can say it with confidence because I look at the text and I study the text. You see, we interpret that 2,000 years later with culture and things have changed. And we're interpreting it from a Christian perspective. If Jesus was indeed communicating that the only way that we can come through God is only through Jesus' religion, then we have all completely missed the boat. Why is that? Because Jesus was not a Christian. No, Christianity was not created yet. Jesus was Jewish. So if Jesus in that statement meant that only way that we can come to the Father is through him, through his religion, then we all should have become Jews first, and then we could have been reconciled to God. His religion, as with many religions, even to this day, continue to teach people that God is angry and God is looking to smoke those who are sinners and the God that they worship and the God that they serve was ex is exclusive only to them and to their religion. Everybody else is wrong. That's not what this text is saying. That's not what this text is saying. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and only through me can you come to the Father. The way. How did Jesus live his life? The truth. What did he teach and what did he say? And his life. How did he live it? How did he engage with people? Was, was he partisan to a particular religion, to a particular race, to a particular culture? It was Jesus who said to his people that this Roman centurion has more faith than anybody he's ever known in Israel, and the Roman centurion was an occupier of their land. How can that be? I am the way, the truth, and the life, he says, and only through me can you come to... In other words, as we know Jesus, as he stays in, if you know me, believe in me, and if you do, you'll know the Father, and you can believe in the Father. That Jesus was consciously one with God, and to know Christ is to know God. Jesus reminded his followers and reminds us even to this day when we read the Gospels that God invites us to share a drink of water on a cold day. When we are strangers and we have no place to stay, God invites us to a seat at her table and feeds and nurtures us and then has a room for us for the rest of the night because in my Father's house are many rooms and there is a place prepared for each of us. And when life places us in a prison, God comes to visit us and then gives us the tools to liberate us from that prison, often of our own making. 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. What that means to me is that as I become a student and a follower of the teachings of Jesus, as I understand them, as I study them, as I integrate them into my life, then I evolve in that same kind of spirit that Jesus had. I become closer to the divine as Jesus was, and I lose more of my ego self, and I start living and being my truest self. And that's that part of me that was created by God. I'm glad Jesus did not give Thomas and Philip a very clear, precise definition of where he was going or what God was. Think about what would have happened if that had taken place. If Jesus had clearly defined in a very, very narrow sense, this is who God is, this is what God looks like, and this is where I'm going, what would we have humanity have done with that? We would have enshrined it. We would have built walls around it. We would have protected it with everything that we had. And if anybody ever said anything else uh, about it or challenged it, then we would have to kill them in order to protect God, right? Oh, gosh, that sounds familiar, church history. If Jesus had done that, we would have put a prison wall around God and not even God's self could continue to evolve and grow and to expand. For me, Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life, and the way to come to God means this. This is how I've come to understand it. I believe that God is to be experienced. I don't know what God looks like. I don't need to know. But I know that I have experienced that incredible spirit in my life. And sometimes more profoundly than others. I know this because I have experienced it. It comes back to that Koine Greek word again. Gnosko. If you were all here, I would be saying that word to know is what? And you would respond? Gnosko, right? Experiential knowing. I believe God is to be experienced. God is to be known in an intimate, experiential way. Jesus continues in verse 7, If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. In other words, to know Jesus and to have seen Jesus was to know the divine Spirit that we call God, because Jesus was consciously one with that Spirit. So to know Jesus is to know God. And when Jesus walked upon this planet, he challenged all of those religious systems and those religious beliefs that taught that God was exclusive only to a certain group of people who had the absolute truth. Jesus challenged those systems that God was angry and ready to smoke and to kill and to undo, uh, undo a sinner. God was ready to completely condemn a whole community if you did not worship in a specific way. Jesus spent his life Challenging those beliefs. Jesus was the one who taught us that God is slow to anger, that God is quick to forgive, that God is unconditional in the way God loves, and God reaches out and cares for all of God's creation. That's what I believe. And even a part of my task in my life at this stage of my career, I continue to want to challenge those popular religious beliefs that somehow God is only for a specific group of people and everybody else better beware. When I look at the life of Jesus and I read those stories, as I have been doing my whole adult life, what do I see? I see a man who transcended his religion, who transcended his culture, who transcended his race to show us a truer image of what God is all about. And what do we see in the life of Jesus to tell us what God is about? Jesus is kind. Jesus is compassionate. Jesus reaches out to those who've been outcast. Jesus intentionally invites sinners, tax collectors, and prostitutes to the table to eat. 
those who society says are not worthy, Jesus builds a bigger room to invite them all in. That in the eyes of God, we are all God's children. We are all have a place at the table. We all have a room in God's house. If you want to know who God is, know who Jesus is, and what can we do about that? I say it often throughout my life and every year. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read them over and over and over and over again. I have been reading them my whole adult life, and I am still making discoveries about who Jesus is, about who God is, and who I am becoming. What's something else that I have learned about Jesus? I don't believe that God is angry and ready to smoke at any immoral thought or activity. God is much more patient than that. God knows what it's like to be human. But what do I know? And what have I learned, especially in the last 10 years? What I've learned is the most profoundly from Jesus is this. The worst thing I can do, the worst thing that you can do, is abandon yourself. You heard it. The worst sin, the worst way to miss the target in this life is to abandon yourself. For you to live consciously, allowing others to define who you are. To consciously allow religion, culture, race, populism, whatever it is, to define you without you ever truly knowing who you are deeply within yourself. And it seems to me an abandoned life is one of regret and one of fear and one of hopelessness. And what I'm still discovering is this. As I continue on my journey to be the best Barton I can be, even in the most uncertain times, I have a peace within me that I will get through whatever life puts in my path. I've not always had that. The more clearly I know who I am, the more focused I am on being who I am and fulfilling my purpose on this planet, that regardless of what's going on in the world around me, even though it may cause pain, it may cause concern, I still deep within my spirit have a peace that I know that I have not been abandoned by God or by Christ, and thankfully not by myself. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. What, if, what, what does this teach me? Where, where, what, what does this mean to me at this stage of my life? Jesus now prepares us for our journey. Well, you may say, Pastor Barton, how do we know what he's prepared for us? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John, Luke, Mark, and Matthew. Read them over and over and over again. But the Bible is hard to read. Yes, so are a lot of things in life. But if it means your life, and it means you becoming the person that God created you to be, maybe it's worth the time and the effort to try to figure it out. Plus, there are all kinds of resources to help you. Personally, I like Luke because he's the best storyteller. And I like the Gospel of John because he's the mystic. Those are my two favorites. If you need to start, start with those. But read them over and over again because then you will start to see how Jesus is preparing you for the journey that you have in your life. Also, What Jesus has taught me, the way for me is this. The teachings in those Gospels go way beyond teaching us how to be good people. He teaches us first that God loves us unconditionally. So once we truly start to believe that, believe me, that lightens the load. 
Because if we think that God is going to smote us at any time, we might be somewhat hindered from exploring and asking questions. He teaches us that God loves us unconditionally. He teaches us how to love ourselves. Love your neighbor as what? You love yourself. You love yourself. So whenever we know God loves us unconsciously, and because of that we can learn how to forgive and love ourselves, then kindness and compassion and love and good works are a genuine expression of what we've been experiencing, what we know. To know Jesus is to know he loves us. To know Jesus loves us is to know God and that God loves us. And to know Jesus and to know God loves us unconditionally prepares us for that possibility that we can also love ourselves unconditionally. And we can move beyond our mistakes in the past and where we failed. We can move beyond those things that keep us small and in tight places. We can move beyond and, become, and live fully, become whole and complete. To know Jesus is to know that even when our hearts are troubled, God is with us. Do not let your hearts be troubled because the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God are working intimately with us whether we know it consciously or not. But it's in the conscious knowing where we find our clarity, where we find our strength, where we find our purpose and our fulfillment in this world, where we make a difference in it. and it's where we also find our what? Our peace, our peace. Don't let your hearts be troubled. I have found great comfort in Jesus' teachings today. And I pray that his words are bringing you comfort as well. Let us pray. Beautiful God, we celebrate that you revealed your true nature to us through Jesus, his life, and his teachings. We're thankful that he taught us to never compromise your soul for anything or anyone, even if it means a cross. He taught us that you love us and that you're not looking to destroy us. He has taught us what unconditional love looks like and feels like. And when we are one with your spirit as Christ was, then we become one with all your creation. And that increases our capacity to love, show compassion, to forgive those who persecute us, and to help others on their journey to find their way. In this uncertain time, O God, may we become intentional about slowing down putting away our distractions and sitting quietly knowing that you're with every beat of our heart and with every breath we take. I love you, God. I love you. Not because I'm afraid of you, because I love you. You give me life and you've helped me through so much. I pray for all of my friends at Windermere Union Church and all of my friends around the world, that we all hear the still small voice that says, don't let your hearts be troubled. 
My house has lots of rooms, and I have one for you. And I'm preparing you for every step of this journey. Thank you, God. Amen.